place where the beer flows like wine. Where beautiful women instinctively flock like the salmon of Capistrano. I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. I don't know, Lloyd. The French are assholes. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I do enjoy a good freedom fry. Welcome to Flynn Dog Woodwork. Today, we're going to take a lesson from the French and install a French cleat system. This is something I've never done before, so come along with me and let's learn together. So I finally got to the point in my shop where I need some more storage. And since I have all this new wall space, I thought what better option than the French cleat system. And this appears to be one of the easiest and most flexible storage solutions to get everything off your horizontal surfaces and get them on your walls. But I've never done this before, but I have done a lot of research. And in doing that research, I found some interesting facts about the French cleat system. The history of the French cleat system is really quite interesting. It was developed by French sailors to get all the ropes off the decks of their ships and placed on their walls. And this really served two main purposes. First, it got those ropes off the decks of their ships and put them on the walls so they wouldn't trip on them. Secondly, it got the wet ropes on the walls so that they would dry. Now, I don't have many ropes in my shop, but I do have a lot of horizontal surfaces that are completely cluttered. And it's really getting pretty bad. All of my horizontal surfaces look similar to this table here, and it makes them completely unusable. Even the sides of these tables have things like clamps stored on them that would be better suited to be hanging on the wall. So let's begin to organize my shop a little bit and build my first French cleat wall. So the wall that we're going to be working on today is right above my router table, which is great because I've got a lot of bits and a lot of accessories that don't have proper storage. Now this wall is approximately 80 inches wide and 40 inches tall. Now the dimensions of this wall were determined by a couple of factors. Let me tell you how I came up with those dimensions. First off, let's discuss the height of the wall. As you can see, I've got an outlet here to deal with, and if I go up 40 inches from the outlet, that's about as high as I can reach. And the 80 inch width gives me a couple of inches from this windowsill and a couple of inches from this bench on the right hand side. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is something that you absolutely do not need to do. And that's to paint the background of this French cleat wall black. This is something that's going to make it look just a little bit better in my shop. And to do this, I'm simply going to grab some blue tape and mark out where I want this background to be. And to assist with the layout, I'm going to use one of these 3D layers so that I know exactly where my tape needs to go. And hopefully you can see these laser lines, so I'm just going to place the tape right on the outside of the lines. With the blue tape laid out, it's now time to take some black paint and paint the interior of this area. Now one thing you'll notice before we add the black paint is I did sand this seam right here. And that's because one of the pieces of plywood was sitting proud of the other plywood. Now luckily I do have a lot of extra white paint laying around. So I'm going to patch that up and retape the bottom so that we can move on with the black paint. So for this application, I'm just going to use some Rust-Oleum paint that's a flat black latex paint. And you may notice that the interior of this paint job wasn't exactly great, but since we're using the black paint, that should be covered right up. And I'll just be using a small roller to apply this. Now here you'll notice me going back to touch the area that we just painted in white. And that's because I'm impatient and wanted to make sure that that white paint was dry. So while we let the first coat of paint on this background dry, now let's talk about how we're going to make those cleats. In order to do so, we need to grab some plywood. In this case, I've got a three quarter inch sheet of oak plywood. Now this is a little bit unmanageable and will be hard to cut over at the table saw. So the first thing that I want to do is to cut it down to 80 inches long. Before we do that, however, I first want to clean up one of the factory edges. This plywood is by no means square and I just want to take my track saw to clean up that edge. And here I'm just using a rail square to make sure we're perfectly square. Once everything's aligned, we can make the cut. Once we have that nice clean edge, I now want to take my track saw and move it over 80 inches. With my tape measure hooked on to our freshly cut side, I'll now take my T-ruler and line it up with that 80 inch marking. Then I can strike a line so that we can make our cut. 
Then with my track saw lined up with that line, I can cut this plywood down to 80 inches exactly. So now we get into a little bit of a tricky situation in cutting out the blanks for these French cleats. Since my cleats are so wide at 80 inches, this is going to be a little bit difficult to do over at the table saw. Now the tool that I'm going to rely on for this process is my Jessam stock guides. As I push my plywood through the table saw, those stock guides are going to push the plywood against the fence. So what I'm going to do first is essentially rip this plywood in half at 26 inches and then it will become much more manageable. With a much more manageable piece of plywood, I'll now rip this down into 5 inch strips. So out of that half sheet of plywood, I was able to get five blanks for cleats, and each one of these blanks will produce two cleats, and that's because we're gonna cut them in half at 45 degrees. Now the interesting thing about cutting each one of these blanks to five inches is that once you go over to your table saw and set your blade to 45 degrees, you should be able to set your table saw fence to two inches and be able to get two cleats at exactly the same size. And that's the theory at least. I've never tried this in real life, but we're gonna try it out now and see if it actually works. And if we look at the end of the two cleats that we just cut, you can see that's pretty much bang on. So I'm pretty pleased with that. So I'm going to continue on and cut out the rest of these blanks at that two inch marking. Now since I am learning as I go here, I think it's important when making these 45 degree cuts to add a feather board. So that's what I've done here. Now once I've cut all my 45s into my cleats, you can see how nicely they turned out. The next thing that I want to do is to soften the very tips of each one of these cleats, and I'm just going to use my Milescraft Edge Sander. And with this sander, I can just run down the cleat with a couple of passes to soften those edges. So now that we have the edges of our cleats softened up, let's go back to our wall, take that painter's tape off, and see what we're working with. So now that we have the painter's tape removed, it's looking a lot cleaner. But it isn't exactly perfect, but that's okay because what we're going to do next will cover all that up. So what we're going to do next is completely unnecessary, but I think it's going to make this French cleat wall really stand out. And that's to put a 2 inch walnut border around the perimeter of that blackboard. So what we're going to do next is to figure out the exact thickness of the plywood we used for those cleats. As we all know, plywood isn't exactly what it reads at the store. So I'm going to grab my fancy dancy new caliper that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago and figure out that plywood's thickness. And here you can see we're sitting at exactly 0.74 inches, which is pretty close to three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to take a piece of this rough cut walnut and mill it down to size. Just as a side note here, this is one of the reasons why I really like this Wixie digital readout. I can dial it in to exactly 0.74 and know that I'm getting the correct thickness of wood. And here you can see how that wood came out to exactly 0.74 inches. Now that I have my walnut milled up, I'm going to rip three strips at two inches wide. Right. 
With our three framing strips cut to width, I now want to take one of those framing strips and cut a 45 degree angle on it. I'll show you what this is going to do later on in the video. Now that we have that 45 degree angle cut into one of the rails, I now want to take that rail as well as another and cut these down to 81 inches. And here I'll just cut off the edge on both of the rails so that we can get an accurate measurement of 81 inches. Now I'll just make my marking at 81 inches and cut them down to size. With my rails cut to size, I'm going to start at four and a half inches and mark every 12 inches going down the entire board. After that, I can carry these markings across both boards. Now that we've made all these markings, I'm now over at the drill press and we're going to use a Forstner bit to drill out holes at each one of these markings. And I've already set the depth stop of my drill press, so now it's just a matter of drilling out these holes. Now with all the holes drilled out, I'm now going to attach the bottom rail. Now the bottom rail is the one without the 45 degree cut. So I'm just going to insert a screw right in the middle of this rail. Now this is three quarter of an inch plywood on the wall, so I'm just going to use one inch screws. With my first screw driven in, I've now placed a level on top of the railing, and now I'm going to drive in the rest of the screws. This time, however, which is what I should have done with the first screw, is I'm going to pre-drill each one of these holes and then drive in the screws. With my bottom rail installed, I now want to install the top rail. And you probably guessed it now, that 45 degree angle is going to act as an extra cleat on the very top. So I'll repeat the process and screw in the first screw. So here I've got the top railing and I'm just making sure that the cleat is facing the right direction. Then I can put in the screw. After that first screw is in, I'll repeat the same process that I did with that bottom railing, placing a level on top and then driving in the rest of the screws. So now that we have the top and the bottom railing installed, I'm just going to take my last piece of walnut and do some referential measurements to get the lengths of each of the sides. So with one end of the railing butted up against the top, I'll simply take my pencil and mark at the bottom of the railing where my cut needs to go. Then I can creep up on that fit over at the miter saw. With both side rails cut to size and dry fit, I can now begin the process of drilling out the holes with the Forstner bits so that we can install these. With both side rails in place, I'll pre-drill and drive in those screws. So now that we have the frame and the background almost completely done, we need to start talking about the cleats. And more specifically, cleat spacing. Since I cut the blanks for my cleats at five inches, I'm gonna need at least six inches for the cleats to be able to clear each other. And that's because if we look at a set of adjacent cleats, we wanna be able to insert a cleat without having any interference from the top cleat. So by having six inches in between the bottoms of each cleat, I should easily be able to insert that cleat. So I'm gonna take a measurement from the top of our board and measure down six inches going down the entire length. And I'll do this on both sides. So what those lines are going to do is to give us a reference point. They're not going to be accurate enough to place the actual cleat. For that, we'll need to make a jig. But before we do any of that, we need to place our first cleat. So for each one of the cleats, we're going to use referential measurement. I'll butt one side of the cleat up against the railing and mark it off at the other side of the railing. Once I have that marking, I'll creep up on the fit over at the miter saw. So now that we have this first cleat cut to size, you can see it fits perfectly both at the top, the middle, as well as the bottom. So we're gonna use this as our master cleat and cut all the others down to size. 
So I'll use the master cleat and strike a line where I want to make the cuts on the other cleats. So now that we have all six of these cleats cut down to size, I'm now going to make markings at every 12 inches where we can place our screws so that we can attach these cleats to the wall. With all those markings made, I'm now going to pre-drill and countersink with this Amana bit so that we can attach these to the wall. With all of our holes drilled out, I'm now going to place the bottom of the cleat in line with that 36 inch marking, and then I can drive in a screw. Once I have that first screw driven in, I'll place a level on top and drive in the rest of the screws. Now that we have that first cleat installed, I've created a little bit of a jig. Let me show you how this works. These are essentially cleat base spacers. You place them into the bottom cleat and then you can place your secondary cleat right on top and this should give you your six inch spacing that you're looking for. So by placing each one of these cleated spacers on each side of your first cleat, you can place your secondary cleat right on top and continue with your installation. It's right about now that I began to realize that you could actually trap those spacers. So what you need to do is to place the spacers on one side and drill in a screw on the opposite side, then remove the spacers and rely on the level. Well, that was pretty easy, other than the spacer issue. This went up very quickly, and I think I'd still make those spacers as long as you use them as I mentioned earlier. There's only one other detail that I'd like to do, and that's to place a dowel into those holes that we drilled with the Forstner bit. I'll flush cut those, and then we can sand and finish. With all of our holes plugged, I'm gonna do a light sanding on all the surfaces, and then we can move on to finishing. With everything sanded up, I'm going to keep it really simple and just use some Danish oil and apply it with a Scotch-Brite pad. And this should really make that oak and walnut pop. Well, I am really pleased with how well this French cleat wall turned out. I was able to knock this out in about three to four hours, so this could be an afternoon project if you have the time. I'm really glad I painted the background black as I think it gives it a lot of character and it really makes that oak and walnut pop. I also really like the fact that I included a cleat on the top rail. This will give me just a little extra storage if I need it. Well, I don't know about you, but I foresee a lot of French cleat builds in the future on this channel. I really appreciate you joining me, and if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and leave a comment. It really does help out this small woodworking channel. Until next time, take care as always.